So it's clear that research is a really important component of the whole book. And I'd like to ask you now to share something about what research you two have done together. Well, we were research collaborators first, and on the basis of that success, you know, really thought that the teaching collaboration and collaborating around this textbook would be something that we could do without conflict, and I think that's been true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we write similarly, we work well together. Yeah. So um, the research that Jen and I have done together has been um, on a theory that we call the relational turbulence model. And uh, we love this word, turbulence. Uh, what it captures is the ways in which couples, when they're going through times of transition, mm -hmm. experience turmoil and chaos that kind of ripples out in their communication experiences. And they also have more extreme reactions to communication episodes that occur within their relationship. Mm -hmm. So I started um, initially studying college dating relationships and looking at the transition from casual dating to serious mutual commitment, which can be a really hard transition within the college age dating environment because, you know, are we a couple, are we not a couple, who knows we're a couple, who doesn't know we're a couple, um, and being committed is a really big deal when there's so many relational alternatives running around. Um, and so finding that uh, evidence as couples were making that transition, they experience a whole variety of different kinds of, of turmoil and stress. They have more negative emotions, they have more intense reactions to conflicts and irritations. And it's so ironic because at the moment when they're making that transition in their relationship from, gosh, I think I really like you, to maybe I love you, they're also complaining more, bickering more, fighting more, experiencing more jealousy, and generally being more unpleasant. So I always have found that really, really um, ironic. But it's also very useful for people to know that when you're having conflict and irritation and negative emotions within your relationships, it doesn't necessarily mean that something's gone wrong. It just mm -hmm. means that you're in a phase of transition mm -hmm. and that maybe there's some questions and some inconsistencies within your relationship that you now have to answer that you didn't have to answer before. Because before you were just another person that I knew, but now you're someone close and serious to me, so we have to work out some things. Mm -hmm. So I think knowing that those transitions can coincide with more negative reactions is really useful information so people don't overreact and end a relationship that might be really valuable. They happen at a time when it's really consequential, right? So if we're having a lot more conflict, but I think we want to get more serious, um, it, it could really throw a wrench in those plans, right? To have all this conflict and this bickering. But, um, one of the things that we've done recently together and separately um, to expand this model is to think about transitions beyond that initial dating relationship, that transition from casual dating to more seriously committed relationships. And so um, we started to look at more um, uh, established relationships, married partners or people who have been together for a longer period of time, and look at transitions during the course of a relationship that also have consequences or that change up um, the well-established routines that this couple may have um, developed over time. So um, Denise uh, has done some work looking at um, the diagnosis of breast cancer and how when people are diagnosed with illness um, and also infertility and how couples cope with those kinds of diagnoses, um, thinking about <clears throat> how that changes the nature of the relationship and how people respond to that uh, transition with turbulence sometimes. I'm excited about all my research, but I'm especially excited about what we were able to contribute to the conversation about breast cancer survivorship. Um, in part because if you look at most of the medical research on and health research on breast cancer survivors, there's a lot of emphasis on how to provide support to breast cancer survivors and you know certainly the numbers, numerous stressors that breast cancer survivors face. But what Kirsten and I were able to do was to look at how this transition that occurs when a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer and the transitions that occur over the course of her treatment influence the relationship and how the relationship influences her experience of breast cancer. So just like any other transition, this is a transition that changes the way in which families and couples organize their lives. Everything from uh, women's uh, self-image, their sexual identity, to their ability to do various um, responsibilities around the household, things get really changed when one of the members of a couple is going through cancer treatment. And, okay, we all knew that, but what we found was that some of the things that happened in the relationship, like being uncertain whether or not your partner still wants to be with you, or feeling interference from that partner in your everyday goals, makes women experience more distress about their breast cancer. 
So from my point of view, anything we can do to decrease the stress experience of breast cancer survivors, we should be doing. And not just focusing on the illness itself, but focusing on the relationship and the communication in the relationship as a way to help women be more resilient and experience less distress. So I feel like we've made a real contribution there in understanding how relationships and communication go hand in hand with coping with a serious illness like breast cancer. Similarly, um, I've done some work with another of our colleagues, Leanne Kumblock, on military couples and how they manage the transitions around their deployments. And so specifically we've looked at um, military couples who are being reunited following a deployment. And you would think that for military couples who have been separated for a year or 18 months sometimes um, while their spouse or their romantic partner is overseas, that that reunion would be something that's really exciting and something to look forward to and that we would rush into each other's arms and kiss like they do in the movies. Um, and that happens. Um, but a lot of people are kind of unprepared for some of the unexpected changes to their relationship um, after the honeymoon phase kind of wears off. And so we've applied the relational turbulence model to better understand how people respond to changes in their relationship from being deployed to being back together. Because during deployment, people adopt a lot of um, behaviors that are adaptive, right? I'm going to try to be more independent. I'm going to think about myself. I'm going to start working out more. I'm going to spend more time with my friends um, while my partner is deployed. And the deployed partner has to do the same. They have to think about themselves and their mission. Often when these people communicate during a deployment, they're more guarded. They don't want to talk about bad things. They don't want to have conflicts uh, because they're separated and they want those conversations to be positive. And when they come back together, you can't be independent anymore and just do what you want to do. Um, you have to reintegrate this person back into your life. And trying to find space for this person again after becoming used to being independent and doing your own thing um, can create conflict. Uh, trying to find space in your life for a person you care very much about but who hasn't been part of your life for a long time. Um, and the things that people were guarded about in their communication during deployment in an effort to protect their partner um, and make them not worry and make them, you know, concentrate on their mission and think about things that are positive, um, if you only focus on the positive, any kind of conflict that gets suppressed in that relationship, I mean, they might bubble up um, eventually and create more conflict and more irritations if you're not talking about the things um, that you may be suppressed during a deployment. So we've spent a lot of time looking at that transition and how people work through how they reintegrate and the uncertainties that arise during deployment, how, they, how those get resolved um, after people are reunited. Um, and so it's been really fascinating, it's been really rewarding to be able to do research on a population of people who are really deserving of um, you know, some interest in the scholarly community, that we can identify uh, communication behaviors that can help them strengthen their relationships and create strong bonds um, and, and work on strengthening those relationships after they come back together, as well as um, maintaining those relationships when they're apart. Okay, so I'm laughing over here because Jen's doing such important research, coping with deployment and redeployment, and my colleague Kirsten has done important research on breast cancer survivors. And when I teach about this in class, I always use the example of when my household moved from one side of the grocery store to the other side of the grocery store, <laughs> and how when the grocery store was no longer on the way home, suddenly my spouse is no longer stopping at the grocery store every day to get food. And it took us about two or three weeks to realize nobody's getting food anymore. <laughs> and it was a huge conflict as we resolved this transition of the grocery store no longer being on the way home. Mm -hmm. So in some ways this is what we try to do within the book, is we take theories and we ground them both in everyday experiences and in socially significant applications to right. help people understand how this might unfold within their lives. Um, but clearly, we just need help getting groceries in my house. <laughs> right, it's just getting food into the house or actually helping people overcome their relational right. Transitions big or small. Transitions big or small. Problems in a personal communication research right. plays a, a, a really significant role. Uh -huh. Well, thank you both. Thank you.